Okay, so, so in my talk, I'm going to uh, continue the discussion in the first part of Joe Fresco's talk uh, about a scheme of full tolerant quantum computing, which is uh, uh, specially designed to deal with biased noise. And in particular, I'm going to focus on how such a scheme would apply to one particular architecture for quantum computing, which is pursued at the IBM uh, Research Lab in New York. Uh, based on superconducting flux qubits. Um, so here's a picture of um, uh, what we call the IBM qubit. Um, it consists of uh, okay, it consists of uh, three superconducting loops. So one is this one. Uh, the one is symmetrically uh, located. And then there's a third one, very small one on top of it. So there are three superconducting loops. And they are disrupted by three uh, Joseph transactions. So the, the superconducting wire has a gap, a very thin gap of insulating material. But the Joseph transaction, there are three of those. You can't see them in this scale. Uh, maybe you can see one gap uh, right there. Um, so three loops, three junctions. And then on the bottom, uh, there are, there's a high quality tra transmission line, superconducting transmission line. You can see it's, it's open-ended. I think the picture is not complete. Probably the transmission line continues on. And you can actually, actually uh, vary the length of the transmission line to, to change the frequency of the photon. I will come back to this later. Um, so there are more features in the picture. Uh, you have these black lines. They denote um, um, uh, transmission lines that are supposed to induce uh, flux through the big superconducting loops. So you actually have a pulse that brings current in, and by controlling the, the current, you can control the flux through the loop. Um, on the top, you also have two squids, two superconducting interfer interference devices, um, which uh, are actually you can think about you can think about as very delicate, very sensitive magnetometers. So by turning them on, you can you can you can measure the flux that goes goes to the loops, the superconducting loops, and and so for this flux qubit, uh, right now the IBM uh, coherence times, uh, maybe that's that's a result a few months ago. They are very very bad. They are 15 nanoseconds. That it, that's a T1 time for the for the flux qubit. But other, other labs, for example, the Delft group has shown that uh, this T1 time can go up to microseconds. Um, so as far as the transmission line is concerned, the Q is currently, uh, they tell me, 10,000, but they can, they can bring it up to 10 million. And they have measured T1, T1 times of the order of 3 microseconds. OK, so to understand how, how this uh, qubit works, there are actually two um, important parameters. Um, one is uh, what I call the bias, epsilon. It's, it's supposed to be a small number, and it corresponds to the flux difference between the two big loops. Okay, and what happens is, uh, because these loops are superconducting, uh, there's a condition which tells that if you, if you travel along the loop, the flux should change by an integer multiple of 2 pi, which, uh, which uh, when you translate it, tells you that the flux to the loop has to be quantized. So that's what I denote by phi naught. And so if the bias is an integer multiple phi naught, um, the, the, the potential, the, the, energy, the energy levels of the, of the qubit have a symmetry. Uh, I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, the, the, the second parameter is what, what we call the control flux. Uh, it mostly corresponds to the flux that penetrates the, the small loop on the top. Uh, and there's a small correction that corresponds to the sum of the flux in the other two loops. Uh, but physically, what you do by changing the control flux is that you, you adjust some kind of a potential value. So the, the cartoon of the energy levels looks something like that. Um, if, the bias, if the bias is set to 0 or an integer multiple of phi naught, then actually there's a degeneracy. So the, the two lowest le, low line energy levels have the same energy. Okay? And, and if the control flux uh, is very small, then this, this, this barrier here is very big. And as you, as you increase the control flux, the barrier comes down and very rapidly vanishes. OK, now to understand more about how, how, the, how the qubit works, what the states are, um, here is a cartoon. So here I've drawn explicitly where the Joseph's interaction are supposed to be, the, these three black lines. And you can think of the two basic states for these flux qubits as just uh, persistent currents through the loops. And, and so there are two states, uh, left and right. 
And you can think about the left state as corresponding to a current in the small loop going this way around it, a current through the, this big loop that corresponds to the, the two big ones and also the small one that goes around this way. And now you may have currents in the, in the two big loops that go either, either this way or backwards. So for the two computation states, the two, the two lo lowest line energy levels, the, the two components of this current are exactly the same, they're just different how the currents uh, rotate in the, in the two big loops. Okay, and depending on, on whether you have a barrier here, depending on the bias, the two states might have the same energy or not. Okay, so, so as I said before, the way you control this qubit is you have these flux lines and you, you apply current and this induces um, uh, flux on the big loops. Uh, so you have to actually, if you want to do gauge, you have to actually say what currents you apply and what, 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 um, what flux you want to apply to your qubit. So, so in a recent paper, the, the, the experimentalist at IBM, together with the theorists at IBM, that worked together with the experiment, so the Vincent and Brito and Brit are, are theorists working for the experiment. And, and this is, these are the experimentalists. They, they, had, they had in this paper a proposal about how you actually do the path gates for this qubit. And what they observed is by taking account the many error sources that they, they, they think uh, they can understand for the qubit, they say that the best they can do is fidelity is up to 99%. <laughs> Okay, and they also observe that for their system, noise is biased. So it's heavily biased and noise is primarily dephasing. Okay, and when, when I ask them, well, how, how biased it is, they tell me, well, it's 10. Uh, so it means uh, sigma x errors are 10 times as likely, less likely than sigma z errors. But if you want it, we can do it better. And so, so they are in a, in a you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting situation. They are in a region in parameter space where by changing their gates, say, by making them uh, longer by a very small amount, they can increase the bias by orders of magnitude, okay? So, but well, that's the result they had in their paper, and naturally they asked me, since this is the best thing we can do with our, with our qubit, if we understand everything else, are we below threshold? Is there any hope? Right, so, so this motivated me to think more, more about this problem, which is, of course, older than, than this paper at IBM, which is what do you do if you know that your system has biased noise? Right, and this is the case for, for many qubits, not only superconducting qubits, as we heard, it's also true for ion traps and so on. So it's an obvious question, and it is can you, can you prove the threshold and the overhead and, and all of that if you know that your noise is biased, right? That, but this is a very tricky question, and, and so I'm I'll, I'll just repeat a couple of things that John Preskill also mentioned, why, why the problem is tricky. So it's tricky because, first of all, you have to avoid explicit in your computation having gates that propagate zeros to x errors, right? That, that would be obviously very bad to do. Okay, but there's another thing. Even if you have gates that don't do that, so if, if all your gates are designed so that phase flips only propagate to phase flips, maybe in order to, to describe noise in this case, you have to actually explicitly have a component of the, of the noise operator that is non-diagonal, it's something like sigma x, right? Which kind of makes sense if you, have, if you want to describe noise in a C node, because a C node conditionally flips the target bit. If you want to describe noise in that process, you have to describe it by a flip on the second bit, right? Okay, so, so the question is obvious, the, the answer is obvious, sorry. Uh, so if you don't want to have these problems, you, you should restrict yourself to gates which are diagonal on the computation basis, right? But there, there's, there's a trick now, because not all computations that have only phase gates are designed to, to work with biased noise. For example, here's a circuit. Uh, if you're experts in secrets, you'll just uh, know immediately that this is just a circuit that does teleportation. So uh, the quantum state that comes in also goes out. And as you can see, the circuit consists of just phase gates. It's the, all the gates are diagonal. And I start with plus states and measuring the sigma x basis. But this circuit doesn't work for our purposes because if you have a z, z error, a phase flip in this qubit, it will flip the measurement outcome, and the measurement outcome will tell you that you have to conditionally apply an x operator on the, out, on the output qubit, right? So this is bad. Right? So, so you have to be careful. Not only do you have to restrict the set of diagonal gates, but you also need to worry about what, what you do condition on your measurements. 
right? So, so this is a version of teleportation. So you shouldn't do teleportation in this scheme, not at the physical level. And, and it's also a version of cluster state computation. So the scheme we, we describe can be seen as a version of cluster state computation, but it doesn't mean that any cluster state computation has the properties that we want. Right, so, so let's go back to the scheme. So what we propose to do is we, we have a quantum circuit. It describes the algorithm we want to we execute. And we're going to use it by, by encoding it in this code. It, this code is a concatenated code. First, you encode using C1. C1 is just a classical repetition code, just a majority code. And, and then after you do that, you encode it further using some other code, C2. I'm, I'm not going to say much about C2 until very much later in the talk. OK, so C1 is a repetition code. And, and you should, you should think about the scheme as, as a series of transformations. So, you, so here's the physical level. You have, you have some parameter that tells you how likely it is to have phasing error, the phasing errors, epsilon. And epsilon prime is the parameter that tells you how likely it is to have any other kinds of errors. And epsilon prime should be much, larger, larger than, much smaller than epsilon in order to, for this scheme to make sense. Right? And now the purpose of encoding the repetition code is that effectively you, you, go into, you flow into a different noise model where you forget about this asymmetry between the two types of noise, and, and all you need is to be below this some number epsilon zero. Say, say epsilon zero is 10 to minus 3, or, or 10 to minus 4, whatever the threshold is for, for general schemes. And now, for the general schemes are based on some code C2, which you can find in the literature, and you use that to make the, to, you use C2 appropriately so that the, the effective error rate at the top level of your coding is as small as you want. Okay, so the, scheme, the, the step we want to we understand is this one, the first one, right? So, so the kind of computer will actually execute this set of gates. It will execute uh, control phase gates. It will prepare plus states, so superpositions of 0, 1. It will measure in the sigma x basis. And, and it will also prepare two other states, uh, which are just uh, the plus state rotated by either pi over 2 or pi over 4 around the z-axis. Okay, now note that here I don't include preparation of zero because if, you, if all you can do is control phase gates, if you prepare zero, it's just trivial. You can do nothing to it. And similarly, if, you, if only you can do control phase gates, if you measure zero, it, it just tells you nothing again. Okay, so, so it's, it's useless. Okay, so the scheme is going to work in this way. So you, you will use these three operations together with a repetition code in order to simulate operations in this set down here. The set consists of the control not gate, preparing zero and plus, and measuring in the two bases, the sigma x and the sigma z. Okay, so with these operators, you create logical operations in this code. These logical operations in, in, in some code. And then you repeat that. That's what this R is supposed to do. You do it many times again. Now, so now you use these CSS operations to make CSS operations for a different code, and so on. Okay, so, so which means in the end, the end is the code C2, you have very accurate CSS operations. Okay, and finally you use these two states you had together with the CSS operations to get a universal set. That's just a detail in the end. Okay, so the real question is, since this, this step is going to work effectively if, if noise is very biased, the question is how biased it is? How do we know? Okay, so in the paper I wrote with, with John Preston, we, had, we said the bias is something like 10 to minus 4. Okay, but now let, let's try to understand what it is for, for at least the IBM qubits. So here's again uh, a picture of it and the energy diagram. And here's a more, more detailed view of, of the energy diagram. So there are three, three cases for three different values of the bias. Remember the bias uh, determines the, whether the, the ground state is, is degenerate or not, the symmetry of the potential. So if you, if you take the case where epsilon equals zero, and very small control flags, you have a symmetric double well. Okay, it corresponds to the case where the flag states, the right and left uh, uh, rotating currents, have exactly the same energy. Okay, now, so, so you are, the, uh, let's, let's say the energy of these two states is just zero by convention, uh, and now imagine that you, you increase the control flags, which means you decrease the barrier of the two states. So now tunneling is very, becomes easier and easier, and then suddenly you see there's a very near, uh, th there's a very uh, narrow region of the parameter space of control flags where the character of the qubit changes. So now the two, the two states start to have different energy, 
and then they saturate and the difference in the energy levels here corresponds to the energy of a photon in the, in the transmission line. Okay, so that's the purpose of having the transmission line attached to the flux qubit. As you increase the control flux, you can transfer information if you did ad adiabatically between the two states in the flux in the flux qubit to the two states in the in the transmission line, zero and one photon in the transmission line. Okay, so the left say goes continues on and the right goes up in this picture if you did adiabatically. Now the other remaining energy levels correspond, say, say this energy level has, has two states degenerate and it corresponds to left and right in the flex qubit and one photon in the transmission line. And this, the two photons in the transmission line and so on. Right? And as you increase the control flux in this case, there's some gap here uh, and you go on like that. Okay, now for non-zero bias, you see that now the, the ground state, even for in the flux, in the flux qubit region, is not degenerate. So the left and the right have different energies. And then again, as you increase the control flux, you again go in a region where you primarily are in a photon, in a photon state. The qubit lives in the transmission line. Okay, and so on down here. So the virtue of the, of the gates we're, we're going to do for with this qubit is that primarily we're going to live in, in, this, in this case where, where the bias is zero. The experimentalists say that in that case they are in the, in the S line, S means symmetric. Okay, we're only going to go in this case when we want to we wanna do gates where we don't have that gates, when we want to prepare, say, a plus state. That, that's the only case where we want uh, a non-zero epsilon, a non-zero bias. Okay, so if you, if, you, if you just think about the epsilon equals zero case, um, what we're going to do is whenever we have our qubits in memory, or whenever a qubit waits, but just before uh, it's about to, to, be, to, be un, uh, to be in a gate, it's going to be, it's going to be in this region. It's going to be a photon. Okay, and in that case, we'll say the qubit is parked. So when a qubit is, is living in a, in a photon state, we'll say it's parked. Just because the, the transmission line has a very long coherence time, so it's, it's kind of safe there. It's not doing anything. Okay, on the other hand, if you want to measure something, you do it via the, the squids. And this means you have, to, you have to be in a flex qubit uh, space. So the squid only measures the magnetic field, so you have to be in the, uh, either left or circularly polarized to be measured. So this means you have, to be, you have to be here, in this region, where actually the qubit is mostly flux, flux state. Okay, so, so as, you, as you have a qubit in memory, if you want to measure whether it's, it's left or right, zero or one, you are adiabatically move in this region, and here you measure when you reach this region. Okay, now when you want to do single qubit gates, um, what you do is, again, you start from this, from this uh, transmission line state, the qubit is parked, and then you slightly, uh, you, you slowly decrease the, the, the control flux, so the energy slightly decreases, you wait a little bit, and then you come back. So just because you, you change the energy slightly and wait for a little bit, you accumulate some phase relative to what the phase would have been if you had stayed where you were initially. And depending on how long you wait, you, you accumulate the appropriate phase for the, for the rotation that you want to do. So if you want to do a rotation around the z-axis by some angle. Okay, so that's how it works. Now, if you want to do, if you want to do control phase gates, you have to think about two qubits. Okay, so here's a picture. The way this works is uh, you either have the two qubits very close to one another so that uh, the flux, the, the, the current that goes through one, the loop of one, one qubit induces flux on the, on the loop of the other qubit. So there's some, some mutual inductance that, that creates a sigma z, sigma z direction between the two qubits. Or if you have the qubits far apart, you can have a transmission line, like say this black line, that goes from, from uh, the neighborhood of one qubit to the neighborhood of a, far, a very, very far away qubit. Okay, so by a series of, of um, um, current flowing through the loops, you can, you can have the sigma z interaction. So the, the complicated thing is that the way it's, because the sigma z, sigma z is, is, is because of mutual inductance, it's always there. You can't turn it off. Now, I'll, I'll describe how you did the phase gate in a, in a bit, but there are also two, two other things to, to note. First of all, uh, really the transmission line uh, have a, has a greater length than the one in the picture, 
And you actually have two kinds of, of qubits. You have what I call A and D qubits. You can call them A and B, but I like to call them A and D because A reminds me of Ancilla and D of data. OK, and you also actually choose the, these two kinds of qubits to have a, a ratio of length of transmission line 4 to 3. That's because, first of all, you don't want a photon from one transmission line to easily go to another. If it was, say, uh, the same frequency or an integer multiple one of the other, it could be easy to, for one photon to become two or three photons in the other transmission line. And it's also because, for practical reasons, you want to have a, a common clock for, for all these qubits. And so if you have a clock, say, that goes into the, the product of the frequency, say, 12, you can count four to be, to be one, one time step for one qubit and three to be ta one time step for the other qubit. So these are practical reasons. Uh, but as a matter of fact, for, for the calculations, we use a ratio of four to three. OK, so again, this means uh, we can only do phase gates between A and D, because between these two different kinds of qubits. We cannot do phase gates between two qubits of type A or D. But that's not really a limitation because of the scheme I'm going to describe. It's actually, it's actually exactly what we need. OK, so to describe what happens when you do a phase gate, uh, it's very simple. It's really described by this picture. So before you do the phase gate, you have two qubits, and they are both packed. So they are both photons, and they don't see the interaction, because the interaction is just uh, an interaction on the, on the flex qubit space. OK, now you, you slowly move them so that they become, they, 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 they leave the parking space, they leave the photon states, and they become flex qubits. So, so remember, here, here we have purely photons, so the flux initially is 1.6 phi naught. And then for both qubits A and D, so this should be D, sorry, you decrease the flux slightly, so you move left in this picture, you move closer to the flux qubit space, you move more for qubit D than for qubit A, you wait a little bit, you wait 35 nanoseconds, and then you go back. So the fact that there is a difference here in the, flux, in the control flux in the two qubits is just what makes, what makes this gate be a controlled phase gate. OK, and it's, it's an adiabatic gate. That, that's why it, it primarily suffers from the phasing noise. OK, you are parked. Again, you are parked. You unpark, so the energy changes a little bit. And then you go back. Now, let me tell you about uh, what kind of error error sources you include in the, I didn't include that, the theories that IBM included in the, in the calculations. So there's, first of all, on the top, there's the systematic part. Okay, in the calculations, they didn't include all the energy levels of the harmonic oscillator that corresponds to the transmission line. And they didn't include all the energy levels of the flux qubit uh, states. They just included two of each, so two flux states, left and right, and two photons in the transmission line. So there's a systematic error in that calculation, but um, it's small, especially what you're, what you're interested about is to, to take, your model should probably take, take into account what, what's the minimal gap, because that, that will tell you what the probability, say, of leakage is when you do your gates. But that's really all you should worry about. So if, you, if you're careful about that, uh, you can be confident that you don't make a, an error of more than 10%, say, in your estimates. So if I tell you later on that a gate fails with probability 1%, it could be 1.1 or 0 0.9, but not, mu not much different than that. OK? And, and below the, the yellow line are, the, say, the, the sources of noise that, that are included in the model. So first of all, you include uh, magnetic noise, low frequency noise, that, that causes uh, shifts in the flux you actually apply when you design this, this, uh, this pulse. And you also include uh, synchronization errors uh, that correspond to how well your pulse generator can time the different pulses that you want to apply. Okay, so it means if you, if you actually design in your computer that you want to apply this pulse, because of fluctuations in the magnetic noise, you might, uh, you might actually apply a pulse that is slightly off, off this curve, both in the, in, the, in the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. Okay. So, so the way they model that in their, in their scheme is they say, for the 35 nanoseconds it, it takes to do a gate, we're going to assume there's a constant offset of the flux and the time from the ideal one. Okay? And, and this constant from, from gate to gate is going to uh, be distributed according to a Gaussian distribution, and the sigmas are here. That's what they do. Okay, this doesn't include uh, higher frequency noise within the 35 nanoseconds, but they, they tell me that's not an important factor. 
Okay, the worst case is a big shift. It's not how, how fast it goes within a gate. Okay, so that's included in the model. Also, another thing is not included in the model is correlations of noise from one shot to the other. Say, if the noise is one over f, then you expect that there's some memory from gate to gate, but here they just simulate one gate, so they don't, they don't include the correlation between the gates. I'll, I'll just make a comment at the end about that. And, and the other source of noise is just Johnson noise, because you have, you have some solid state circuit, there's some resistance, there's some noise in that, and so this limits the, the coherence time to be no better than 10 milliseconds in this device. Okay, so that's what we'll tell you as the best estimate we can hope to have for T1. Okay, so here's a list of, of the gates we want to do. On the, on the, the, four, the first four gates are the gates we're actually going to use, and the last two uh, are the gates we don't need to, but I'll just make some comments about them. So if you think about uh, what the noise rate is for the phase gate, um, I just uh, divide into two cases, uh, qubit A and D, because we have two species. So as you'll see systematically, qubit D, it's much more noisy than qubit A. But what you should also notice is that the, the, the gates are designed so that there's a, there's a contrast of, say, of, of at least 10 to the minus 3 between uh, unstructured noise, which is this number, and dephasing noise. And, and this is the probability of leakage is also a factor almost 10 to the minus 3 lower than dephasing noise. Okay, so, so they have tried... They have tried hard to make the bias, the, the bias between phase no, purely phase noise and any other kind of noise, including uh, sigma x noise, sigma y noise, and leakage to be at least 10 to the minus 3. And you can see that for a phase gate, they can do that. So, so for qubit A, for example, you see the bias is even greater. Now, they have also tried, especially before, before knowing about the, this new scheme of, of doing computation with bias noise, they were also trying to do a C node. And it's, and it's interesting because they can't, really. So they, there is no, they, they know of no direct way of doing a C naught with fidelity greater than, well, this is the other rate, with fidelity greater than 80%. So all the C naughts they have tried have, have, greater than, have almost 20% error. And of course, you might say, well, there are indirect ways of doing a C naught. So if you have just phase gates and measurements and stuff, you can simulate a C naught, and that's, that's correct. Uh, but you, you need to use either three phase gates or phase gates and higher ones. Okay, so, so it's kind of complicated. Okay, let me show you what the numbers are for, for single qubit gates. So these are rotations around the z-axis by, by an angle phi. You can see they are very accurate. So there are three orders of, of magnitude almost, or two, between two and three better than, than phase gates. And actually you have a contrast of 10 to the minus three a bias of 10 to the minus 3. And also note how much harder it is to do a HANA mark compared to a Z rotation. And also for a HANA mark, you can't, they can't have this bias in the noise. The, the leakage is really almost as likely as, as a Z or an X error. Okay, and here are the numbers for, for preparation and measurement. So for measurement, uh, this number includes both the phasing and leakage and sigma x error, that just because everything is, behaves like a sigma zero when you do a measurement. Um, and for preparation, again, you have, you have different numbers for the two kinds of qubits, and then the contrast is slightly less than 10 to minus 3, but, but it's big enough for our purposes. OK, so let's, let's go back to the scheme. Uh, that, that John Preston described this morning. Uh, I won't really say more about it. Uh, so just this picture, it was also in Preston's uh, slides. So if you want to simulate a, a C0 gate using this repetition code, the way you, we propose you do it is, well, in this picture, we use a three-bit repetition code. And in fact, in the end, I'm, I'm going to tell you that's, that's what you should use also for the IBM qubit. So this, this is a realistic picture. So each qubit becomes three. And then you prepare three and in the plus state up and down. And then you measure here the, the weight 6 operator, which is a z on all these 6 qubits. And also you measure the weight 9 operator, which is a z on all these qubits. And then you measure each one of these qubits in the x basis. That's all. And now you have done a logical c between the two blocks. OK, so, so here's how the circuit would look like if you, had, if you wanted to simulate actually two c in a row in this configuration on the, on the left. 
Okay, so what is inside the yellow box here becomes this yellow box down here, and this is part of the preceding simulation. Now, one thing that I had to worry uh, additionally um, when I was thinking about the IBM cube is that uh, you have leakage. Uh, so to, to just explain what the problem with leakage is, uh, let me go from this slide to this slide just by explicitly showing how to do this measurement. You have an ancilla, and then you control this operator and you measure. And I've done this here again. You do the same thing up here, but I just don't show it in the picture. Okay? So the problem with leakage is that, that you need to think additionally about is that if a qubit leaks, namely if it, if it leaves this state you, you think it is, this, this, this subspace, the 0, 1 subspace, then if it interacts later with another qubit, there's some chance that the other qubit will also leak. And so leakage can propagate from qubit to qubit, and you know that error correction is not effective unless all your qubits start on the computation basis. Okay, so th th there seems to be some, 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 some concern there that perhaps before you actually measure all your qubits, or before you are able to do error correction, everything will have leave the, the Hilbert space you think they should be, and then, and then you're doomed. Right? Of course, the, the, the chance that a qubit which has leaked is going to propagate to another qubit is very low. They calculate it, and it's, it's, you, th you can't think about it as order 10 to minus 3. Okay, so it's low. But if you do many, many gates in a row on a single qubit which have leaked, then it becomes significant. So, so we wanted to have a simple way to block leakage. So, and, and if you think about it, there's actually a simple way to prevent leakage. So the process I described was, in the picture is, imagine this qubit has leaked. You do some gates on it. Leakage goes down to this ancilla. And then you do gates on the ancilla. It goes up to this block. And then on, and then down to this ancilla, and then on, and then on. And there's no way to stop leakage in this picture. It can, can go off forever. So what I want to do is I want to stop this process, and the way to do it is instead of having one ancilla which interacts with, with two blocks, with both blocks, I want to have two ancillas, each one interacts with a different block, and then after you interact with the two blocks, you, you couple the ancilla. This signal measures z, z on the, two, on the two qubits, and you also measure x, x in the end. Okay? Now, it doesn't take much to understand that this circuit does exactly the same as this circuit, Provided you repeat this measurement a few times to gain some confidence about the eigenvalue that you measure here, because the circuit is not, is not fault tolerant. But what is nice about this circuit is that there is no way that a single leakage in this circuit or preceding this circuit can propagate from block to block. Say, if a leakage is already in one of these, if, if one of these qubits has already leaked, then maybe this ancilla will leak. But this ancilla doesn't interact with this block, so there's no way leakage can propagate up here. And similarly for the other for the other block. And of course, in the beginning, in the beginning, you might you might have thought, well, if you have if you have leakage, a natural way to prevent leakage is to teleport every qubit, right? But in the beginning, in the beginning, I told you you're not supposed to do teleportation in this scheme. That's because teleportation has both sigma x and sigma z corrections. So you, you need to do something different than teleportation if you want to use this scheme. And and that's one one thing you can do. Okay, so let's end with some comments. So, um, the question they had asked me is, are we below threshold? And uh, yes, I can say, with the numbers you have given me, and I listed in, in, a, in a slide a few, a few slides ago, um, yes, this, these numbers are below threshold, and, and to achieve that, you need to take C2, this, this code that you, you use after the repetition code, to be a concatenated four qubit code, and you also need to use message passage, passage decoding. I call this a Fibonacci scheme. This is an idea first uh, that first appeared in Manning Pills papers. And, and you also use a three-bit repetition code in the, on the physical level. And if you do all that, then you can see that the, the, the error rate drops from the numbers at the physical level to zero after enough, enough levels of coding, which tells you you are below threshold. Okay, should we celebrate? Yeah, of course we should celebrate because, well, it's not easy to be below threshold, right? But, but here are three reasons uh, that you should be cautious about this. The first reason is that the analysis shows, the analysis, you know, it's just equations, right? The analysis shows you are below threshold, but you're not far below threshold. You're just below threshold. Which means if you, if you, if you believe the, ana the analysis is exact, you would need very, very many levels of coding to achieve anything. So the overhead, overhead would be very deep. Number two is that the scheme I described is not actually geometrically local. So qubits need to interact, which are not nearest neighbors. And the third thing is that, as I have mentioned, you expect noise to have 
a kind of a one over f uh, spectrum character, which means it should be correlated from gate to gate, and this is not included in the analysis, right? I didn't show any memory. Okay, but maybe that, now that's not that bad. Okay, so if you wanna if you wanna see the optimistic side of problem number one, um, well, you can you can go back to to, to the analysis by Manik Neil, which is very similar to what I've done. Although my, my analysis is just equation, the here analysis was just numerical, and and his analysis shows that the threshold is actually above one percent, and my analysis say, says the threshold is ten to minus three. So there's a gap of ten in the two in the two numbers. So maybe there's a gap of ten in, in the numbers I have here. Which means actually this, these numbers for the M, the M qubit are, are actually well below the threshold and the overheat is not so bad. Okay, so, so number two, what about locality? Well, just note that the, the codes are used are, are, you are extremely simple, right? You, you use a three bit repetition code and on top of it you use a four qubit quantum code and that's all. So since, since the curves are very small, I expect that it will be relatively easy to make them local by, by having swaps or some other mechanism. So I don't expect locality to be a big issue, although this has to be worked out by someone who works more accurately. And finally, about the, the issue of, of correlated noise. Um, well, the experimentalists tell me that this 1 over f noise is primarily due to spins that are stuck around the, the, your, your qubit. So, so they don't move; they just there, and they, they process one, they process around with some with some very low frequency. And since they don't move around, all they can do is just correlate errors between this qubit and the same qubit in the next time step, and so on. So, you know, they, they will just correlate errors between uh, different time steps, but on the same qubit. So, and because in this scheme it doesn't matter if a qubit is erroneous, it, it, it does not matter if you have more errors on the same qubit. I don't expect this to be a big a big problem. Okay, provided you don't have long range correlations, which of course you have, you should, you should worry about. Okay, so uh, I think the, the most important part is that there's a message from, from this scheme uh, that, that John Preskill and I uh, formulated, and it's that um, experimentally should not really try very hard to do a C node, and you saw in this IBM qubit, if you really try to make a C node, you would be, you would be very depressed because the, the, the error rates are 20%. Right, and, and it's okay if you can do a phase gate. It's very good as long as as you can do it with very biased noise. And, and the second lesson is, if you know in your system that, that noise is biased, well, you should make it more biased. The more biased, the better. Okay. So if you want to know, know more about this, uh, so if you want to know about how, how to calculate things about fault tolerance, you should read uh, this paper with, with Gottesman and Preskill. Um, if you want to know about this idea of using the four qubit code and, and message passes decoding, uh, it's hidden uh, very carefully in one part of the appendix in this paper, and it's more explicitly described in this paper I wrote. And if you want to know about the scheme for, for biased noise, this is the archive of the paper with, with John Preskill, and, and this is the IBM team I discussed with, and probably will write the paper together. Okay, thanks. physical level, I did, I did really mean whatever happens after you do all these clever dynamic of the coupling uh, schemes. Yeah. So what is the overall single qubit error? If you compare, say, uh, initial state that you measure in some uh, basis, what would the order of the error such experiment? Well, of course, it depends how long we wait, but, uh, you know, the error rate, the error rate is, is the same as for, for memory, I would say, or for Z, for Z noise. So it's very good. It's 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 5. 10% you said at the very beginning. 10%? Yes. Um, Did I say 10%? This, this one? Uh, no, I didn't say 10%. I said uh, if you want to do a C note, the error rate is... 
but for memory it's very good. And provided when you, when you speak about memory, you speak about a qubit which lives actually in the transmission line. So the transmission line has a very good T1 for, for these systems. Okay, for a single qubit it would be less than 1%, yes, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, well, so well below 1%. You're able to check if this is really quantum or not. Okay, the next question. Yeah, or well, I would bet so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe you explain this and I just missed it, but uh, you should have an old phase gate and your qubits are right next to each other. But uh, how would you take that uh, idea and scale it when they're not necessarily next to each other? Well, there are two, two answers. One is you might design your circuit so that you never have to talk to farther than your nearest neighbor. Or you might actually hardwire transmission lines that connect two distant qubits by a transmission line so that by mutual inductance you can have two loops farther away talk to one another by a sigma z, sigma z interaction. One, one thing I didn't, sorry, it just occurred to me, one thing I didn't emphasize is how big the qubit is. Okay, so, so you see the scale, uh, it's almost one meter, millimeter wide, so you can actually see it with your eye. Okay. It's, it's not a micro qubit, it's a, it's a macro qubit.